Hi everyone, uh, can you please confirm if I'm visible and audible to you all? Just uh, show me a thumbs up, please. <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> okay, guys, so let's begin. Uh, welcome to the session. I'm Vishnu Vijay, a proud Fintrammer, and uh, I'll be your faculty for the advanced audit and assurance paper. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Just uh, give me a thumbs up when it's visible, okay? Great. So uh, let's begin. <clears throat> So first of all, let us uh, let me just introduce myself. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm Vishnu Vijay, uh, and I am a, a professional auditor in one of the big four firms. And I have been teaching uh, the Tripoli paper along with several other ACC papers like PM, APM, and WA as well for the past uh, three years. So uh, in, in this session, we will be looking at uh, just an overview as to what the advanced audit and assurance paper is all about. And of course, we will also be uh, having a look at uh, some basic topics from this particular session so that you can get a brief idea as to what exactly we're de uh, dealing with as well. So first of all, let me just speak more on the advanced uh, audit and assurance paper. So when it comes to the AAA paper, as you as, as you all know, it's an optional paper. And of course, uh, you know, when it comes to the AAA paper, I, I really hope that, uh, you know, you attend this one either with or after the SBR paper. Because when it comes to AAA, it's basically 60% of SBR level accounting standards. And of course, uh, the rest of the 20% uh, is basically what you have learned in the AA paper. And the rest of the 20% is basically something that you learn uh, as a new topic, as the advanced auditing uh, auditing standards and concepts. That's, that's basically what the AAA paper is comprised of. Now, uh, so when it comes to uh, AAA, there's a, a key concept that you should keep in mind. Uh, when I say SBR level accounting standard, it's kind of similar to what you may have learned in the FR paper as well. But still, don't worry too much on that because we will we we are still you know going to cover all the uh, or we will be revising through these standards or we will be uh, having a deep look into the accounting standards as well while we go through the entire uh, you know syllabus of uh, AAA. Now, uh, when it comes to uh, advanced audit and assurance. There are two things, you know, just like all the other papers as well. There are two primary things that you should focus on. One is you guys have to learn the concept because you have to learn what the, uh, you know, audit, audit related standards are, what the, uh, what an auditor do uh, when it comes to the actual practice of audit in the audit profession. Uh, what are the regulatory standards? What are the, uh, how do you identify audit address? All these things should be learned. So content should be there. You should have an in-depth in -depth knowledge of the content. And secondly, you should also be able to apply that particular uh, knowledge or concept to a practical scenario as well. So these are the primary things that you should have when it comes to you should that you have to, uh, you know, have to learn when it comes to the uh, AAA paper. Now, uh, moving ahead. <clears throat> so first of all, let's take a look at the syllabus of AAA and understand what all things will we be looking at in this particular paper. So we have quite a few uh, syllabus areas here, isn't it? So let's start with the first one that is part A, regulatory environment. So when it comes to regulatory environment, first of all, we will be looking at the basics of audit. Okay, we will learn as to what audit is, what are the uh, core concepts, or what are the fundamental concepts that we need to learn uh, to tackle this paper or tackle the rest of the syllabus areas, syllabus areas as well. And uh, secondly, we will also be looking at the regulatory aspect. What are the laws and regulations that an auditor must follow when conducting the audit practice? So this is something that we learn in part A of the syllabus itself. And in part B, we learn about professional and ethical considerations, which is a really, really small and easy uh, syllabus area, I would say, because when it comes to uh, professional ethics, this is something that's covered in several other uh, professional level papers as well. Now, uh, it's just that when it comes to the AAA paper, you will have to apply those concepts in a practical scenario. You have to learn as to what exactly is the right thing to do in a particular scenario and what is not. What are the uh, is there any ethical threats? If there is, then what is the appropriate action that a particular auditor must take? All these things should be covered when it comes to part uh, B of the syllabus. And in part C, there is quality management as well. 
And this is yet again, uh, you know, I, I would say an improvised topic because we used to call it as quality control, but now it's quality management because it's it it covers a bit more uh, broader area. Now that's that's basically all there is to it. It's basically the do's and don'ts of an audit firm, and uh, you know, the qualities that an auditor should have when conducting the audit practice. That's basically all as to what uh, Part C is. And then we move on to part D, which is planning and conducting uh, an audit of historical financial information, where we learn the entire audit process from the planning stage to the execution phase. Okay, not the reporting. Reporting is something that we cover in part E. But in, in, in part D, we're primarily doing two things here. One, we will be learning as to as to as to what happens in the entire audit process, like an external audit process from the planning phase to the execution phase. And of course, we will also be looking at some accounting standards in this particular uh, syllabus areas as well. So we will be revising our knowledge uh, on these syllabus areas and learn what are the core principles that you need to have in mind when attempting for the AAA exam. That's basically something that we cover uh, in part D of the syllabus as well. Now. When it comes to part E, in part E, it's all about completion review and reporting, where we focus on the reporting phase of the audit process. And when I say audit, I'm talking about external audit, not internal audit or the other, uh, you know, assurance engagements that we provide. But uh, in, from part D to E, we will be, our primary focus is on uh, the external audit process. And then we move on to part F, which is other assignments. And this is basically some other services that audit or audit firms provide, such as uh, review of interim financial information or review of prospective financial information, which are basically financial statements which are prepared, uh, you know, uh, prepared with estimates. Well, basically budgets and stuff like that. That's that's basically all there is to it. And of course. Uh, uh, there's also several other uh, interesting concepts that we learn here, such as uh, forensic audit and various other areas as well. Now, uh, then we have part G, where we talk about current issues and developments, which are the uh, you know uh, current industry factors or current industry developments and uh, revisions in various accounting standards or newly introduced or proposed. Uh, you know, audit, oh, sorry, not accounting standards, but yeah, audit standards, etc. All these things will be uh, discussed over here. Currently, we have uh, quite a few interesting areas such as uh, sustainability and uh, various other areas as well. Uh, data analytics is one thing. Uh, uh, that's that's another interesting area. Uh, how we how we uh, it's all about how we implement data analytics techniques when it comes to uh, the audit practice nowadays. So that's that's another really interesting area that we cover when it comes to part G of the syllabus. And then we have part H. This is something that has been newly added since the previous September session. Uh, because uh, this is an area where, uh, because as we as we all know now, when it comes to the optional papers these days, it's 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 just uh, it's eighty percent technical marks and twenty uh, uh, twenty percent or twenty twenty marks are basically professional marks, isn't it? So what are the professional skills that are uh, that will be tested in the exam? How do we uh, you know how do we uh, how do we achieve marks or how do we score those professional marks in the exam or what are the what are the uh, or what should be the nature of your answer in order to score these professional marks all these things would be discussed in uh, part edge part, part edge is something that we learn while we do the questions it's it, there's no there's no theoretical knowledge to learn here it's just uh, it's just the you know practical application of certain exam techniques and stuff, which can improve the quality of your answer and which can help you score those 20 marks or 20 professional marks in a bit more easier manner. That's that's basically all uh, as to part H is. And finally, we have part I, employability and technology uh, skills as well. So when it comes to employability and technology skills, it's uh, there's yet again, uh, this it's, it's not a theoretical area. It's yet again, a skill that you need to develop just like the professional skills. You, this It's a skill that you need to develop in order to, uh, you know, in order to answer or in order to, in order to present your answer uh, efficiently and effectively in the CBE environment. And of course, don't worry, we will of course be practicing a lot of questions uh, throughout our sessions uh, where, where we, uh, you know, where we, uh, talk about these exam techniques that can uh, save a lot of time and of course uh, that can help you structure your answer in a bit more presentable and a bit more impressive manner in front of the examiner as well. So that's basically as to what the syllabus of uh, advanced auditing assurance is. So is there any questions up until now? 
just uh, let me know in the chat section, okay? Or you can unmute yourself and speak as well. That's that's also fine. All right, I, uh, I guess not. So let me just move on to the next aspect. <clears throat> So now let's talk about the exam structure. Of course, you uh, you would be really interested into knowing this part of the uh, this part of the uh, you know this part of the paper as well. So when it comes to the AAA exam, it's basically a three hour and fifteen minutes exam. Okay, guys. So there's no change in that. But uh, the only I would say newly introduced concept is that of professional marks. So let's discuss about that, shall we? So we have two sections in this particular exam. There is the uh, one second. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, so there is section A and section B. In section A, you have one 50 mark case study question. And out of these 50 marks, 40 marks will be technical marks, which is basically the marks that you score by, you know, writing the content of that particular requirement that has been, uh, you know, asked in the scenario. That's that, that's basically as to how you score those uh, 40 marks. And the rest of the 10 marks out of these 50 is basically the professional marks available. Now, you don't have to write anything extra for these 10 marks. It's just that, you know, it's it's it's, it's all in the way in which you answer or in the language and the presentation and the structure, all those aspects and in the points that you include as well. So that's that's where you score those professional marks. There's nothing extra to write here. So uh, just to, and that's a really happy news because, uh, you know, initially there are students who uh, had a lot of uh, difficulty in completing the exam due to uh, time-related issues. But, you know, now that we have this professional marks available, that that particular issue has been reduced to a certain extent as well, uh, which is great, isn't it? So that's that's basically something. Uh, so uh, moving on to the next aspect, <clears throat> we have section B. In section B, we have two twenty-five mark questions as well. And these 25 mark questions are actually case study questions. Okay, folks. Uh, so uh, I can see a question in the chat box. Let me just uh, take that real quick. Uh, any summary of syllabus area for quick revision after the course? And yes, we will definitely be having uh, a revision session where we will be revising through all the key concepts in the syllabus area. And of course, there would be revision notes and, uh, you know, related res resources like that attached to it. So we will definitely be, uh, you know, providing uh, those as well. So uh, that's uh, to answer your question, Rangan. Now, uh, okay. Uh, now, moving on <clears throat> to the next aspect, uh, we have, yeah, section, uh, in section B, we have two 25 mark questions and each 25 mark questions will have, is comprised of 20 technical marks and five professional marks. Okay, folks, so there are different professional skills that are tested here. We will, of course, get into that. But uh, as of now, just uh, keep this in mind. It's it's just about, uh, you know, the total technical marks that is available to you in the exam is, as I mentioned earlier, it's 80 marks. Okay, folks, the rest of the 20 marks is basically professional marks, which I can, uh, you know, I can, I, I have to raise this again because there could be, there are a lot of questions regarding uh, professional skills and professional marks uh, these days as well. So uh, it, it's not about writing something extra. It's about, yet again, the structure in which you provide your answers and the relevant points that you include in your answers as well, which is something that we always discuss when practicing, you know, uh, practicing questions uh, in, in a live session as well. So definitely you don't have to worry much about those. We we can definitely uh, crack these things. Just a simple uh, set of exam techniques to be adopted. That's basically all there is to it. Now, moving on to the next aspect. <clears throat> We have professional skills. Uh, so when it comes to professional skills, there are, uh, you know, it's basically the 20 marks uh, within the exam. And it comprises of four sets of professional skills. Okay, folks, there is the communication skill. There is the uh, analysis and evaluation skill. And of course, then there is also the uh, professional skepticism and judgment. And finally, commercial acumen skin, uh, skill as well. So when it comes to the exam, I could say that the first three is kind of easy for us to implement or for us to, you know, showcase in the exam. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, one second. I see another question. Uh, spelling mistake reduced the professional marks. Not exactly. Okay, folks. So when it comes to, uh, uh, when it comes to the exam, uh, you know, 
it is about the structure and the clarity of presentation. Okay, folks, it's sp spelling mistakes are not much of an issue because uh, they, they do understand that, uh, you know, it's it's a time pressured exam. So obviously there could be minute spelling mistakes here and there when you type, you know, at a really, really fast pace. So that's that's considerable. There's, there's no uh, problem with that. But uh, at the end of the day, your answer should have that clarity. So that's basically the uh, primary point to consider here. Okay, folks. So uh, whatever you're writing, it should be clear to the examiner as to what what exactly are you explaining in that particular scenario. So that, that's 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 basically all there is to it. So spelling mistakes, I would of course avoid it. That's that's definitely there, but it's not uh, you know a major issue, I would say. So yeah. Now uh, coming back to the uh, content here. Uh, First of all, there is communication skill. So uh, I'm glad that you raised that question here because when it comes uh, the spelling mistakes and clarity aspect, not not the spelling mistake, but yeah, the clarity aspect is primarily uh, in relation to this uh, communication skill right here. So the idea behind communication skill is that first of all, your answer should have a structure. And this communication skill is primarily tested in the 50 mark question itself, not on the 25 marks. It's just uh, tested in the uh, 50 marks itself. And uh, so one more add-on point is that the 15 mark question is usually uh, something that is tested at the planning stage of an audit. Okay, that it won't be a forensic audit, it won't be any other assurance engagement, it'll be an external audit itself, and it'll be at the planning stage of the audit. Okay, folks? And uh, out of the 10 professional marks out of for the 15 mark question, uh, maybe three to four marks could be scored as the uh, as the communication skill related marks. Okay, folks, so how do you get these? Well, it's kind of easy. You just have to structure the answer appropriately. And of course, uh, you just have to, uh, you know, explain things with headings and subheadings as well as explain things clearly. Or, uh, you know, the examiner should understand what exactly are you trying to mention in that particular situation. Okay, folks, that's basically what communication skill is all, not all about. Not much about the, uh, you know, spelling mistakes and grammatical mistakes even uh, as well. So, uh, but yeah, I would definitely avoid those, uh, those things uh, when it comes to the actual exam. Now, moving on to the next aspect, we have analysis and evaluation skill. So analysis and evaluation skill is basically a, a, an area that's kind of easy to uh, you know, score marks on because it's it's all about using the financial data or financial statements, extracts, and various other, uh, you know, various other data provided in the scenario and just, you know, providing some judgment and providing some, uh, you know, comment on it. That's that's basically all there is to it, such as it also includes things like calculating materiality and, you know, stuff like that. That's basically where we use the analysis and evaluation skills. And uh, it's primarily used when identifying you know, audit risks or issues in a particular scenario. That's that's basically all there is to it. And when it comes to professional skepticism and judgment, this is kind of easy to implement, especially in an audit exam, because uh, professional skepticism is basically a skill that uh, every auditor should have throughout the audit process. And you may have heard that from your uh, several, uh, you know, work experience as well. So uh, when it comes to professional skepticism and just judgment, it's all about understanding the scenario and challenging certain information as well. We're not going to completely believe on everything that the management uh, provides us with or the data that the management provides us with or information that that has occurred in a particular uh, scenario as well, isn't it? Sometimes we will have to, sometimes, not every time, but yeah, sometimes we we would have to challenge some of the information that is provided in the uh, scenario. So that's basically how we how we score these particular uh, marks in the exam. And finally, we have commercial acumen as well. It's a bit difficult to uh, implement this, but not not impossible, I would say. So the, with a with a particular exam technique, we, you could definitely uh, you know score these professional marks in the exam as well. It's all about demonstrating an awareness of the client that you're auditing and trying to provide them with a solution and stuff like that. That's basically all there is uh, to it when it comes to these professional marks. Of course, we will be practicing a a lot of past paper questions as well, so that uh, you can understand how exactly are we implementing this in various areas of the. Uh, uh, of the, of a particular question as well. So yeah, definitely we will be uh, covering that. Now, uh, moving on to the next aspect. So how exactly do we prepare for the exam? Let's try to understand that, shall we? It's basically a step-by-step -step process. First of all, it's kind of obvious you have to learn the entire syllabus. Okay, folks, when I say learn the syllabus, I just don't mean the core topics like audit risk or uh, you know, several other areas that we are about to cover as well. I mean, cover 100% of the syllabus. 
because uh, you know you cannot expect as to what can be tested in the exam. So and of course you should have a have an in depth understanding of all these standards so that you can you can develop that thinking mentality of a professional auditor in an industry. That's basically the uh, idea behind covering 100% of the syllabus. And of course, we will be covering 100% of the syllabus throughout our uh, uh, throughout our sessions as well. So uh, don't worry much about that. Now, uh, when it comes to the nature of the classes, well, I could I could definitely say that uh, we would be uh, you know covering around maybe. Uh, maybe 70% of the uh, syllabus on a on a fa live face to face uh, sort of uh, i would say yeah uh, live online uh, sessions itself but uh, some there would be some sessions recorded uh, some sessions will be provided to you as a recorded session as well okay folks so but at the end of the day we will be covering everything that is necessary for you to uh, tackle the exam as well so that's that's definitely uh, over there now Moving on to the next step. So after learning the syllabus, what is the next step? It's The next step is obviously to practice, practice, and practice as many questions as you can. Okay, folks, so that's basically, I know it's kind of obvious, but uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really important point and really uh, is something that uh, most students, especially uh, people who are, you know, working professionals as well, they tend to miss out on this particular part as well, because, you know, uh, it, it, the idea here is that uh, you know, some people, what they do is they tend to devote more time into learning the concepts rather than uh, practicing questions. But at the end of the day, you're writing an exam. And of course, in order to learn how to how to uh, tackle the questions that can come up in the exam, you will definitely have to uh, learn how to apply the knowledge, right? And th this particular skill of, you know, application of knowledge is something that can only be developed with practicing uh, you know, ask many questions, especially past paper questions as well, which is step three. After practicing questions from various resources like your, uh, you know, revision kits, exam kits, or the questions that I will be providing you as perhaps a homework uh, within the sessions itself. Uh, other than that, try to try to get as much resources as possible and try to do as many uh, questions as possible, as many variety of questions as possible as well. Okay, folks, so that's that's a really key point when it comes to step two. And then we move on to step three, which is basically doing the past paper questions as well. I know that, you know, some of the questions available within the, uh, you know, uh, uh, as the past paper questions within the ACC's website as well seems a bit outdated. For example, uh, you know, uh, questions from September 2022 are really relevant because they have that uh, professional marks introduced into those question papers, right? And uh, this is a common question that most students have as well. So uh, should I just focus on these or can I also practice uh, the question papers before that as well? I can definitely guarantee you that, you know, the question papers even before the September 2022 sessions are also relevant because, uh, you know, technical marks are still there and technical marks is basically the majority of marks available in the exam, right? So you need to learn how to score those technical marks in order to do that, definitely uh, definitely tackle those uh, uh, that tackle those past papers. I, I, I believe there are questions from maybe 2015 or since that particular date within the ACC's websites itself, within the uh, past paper exam library as well. So just uh, keep, on, keep on practicing that. That's another uh, uh, aspect that should be included. And of course, we will of course be, uh, you know, practicing some, most of these, uh, uh, most of these past paper questions uh, when it comes to uh, throughout our session as well. So that's that's basically another aspect that we will definitely be including. And there's also the uh, revision bootcamp that will be provided to you, which which are basically uh, which is basically a set of uh, recorded questions, which uh, which where I explain some exam techniques, uh, some more exam techniques, I would say, because we will definitely be discussing most of the exam techniques or all of the exam techniques within the sessions, but there are different types of questions that can be tested in the exam. So we will be discussing those exam standard as well as past paper question, or you will be provided with a recording of those exam standard and uh, past paper questions and how to solve them as well. That's, that's another uh, set of things that we uh, provide uh, to you throughout this particular session, <clears throat> throughout this particular course. Now, uh, moving on to the next aspect. So we have learned the syllabus, 100% of the syllabus. We have practiced questions and we have, uh, or we will, I would say, uh, we will uh, practice the past paper questions as well. Now, the next step is to read the examiner's report. Now, this is a really crucial thing. Why exactly is that? Because the examiner's report is something that, uh, you know, uh, something that 
gives you an idea as to what is the examiner's expectations and what is it that they expect from you as a candidate or, or, or what is an answer that they that can impress them all these things could, can be understood from this particular resource itself okay folks so that's basically why it's really important that you guys uh, have a look into the examiner's report as well so that's that's something that's there and of course uh, we will be re, uh, debriefing one of the uh, you know one of the most recent examiners report throughout one of our sessions as well. So that's something that we also include. And step five is the, the most important step out of them all. And this is basically uh, where we provide you with mock exams. Okay, folks, so uh, it's really important because it, it is said that Attent attending a particular mock exam can increase your chances of passing by uh, 30%. Why exactly is that? Because uh, when attempting a mock exam, you will uh, get that exam feel or you will uh, be a bit more familiarized with the with the exam atmosphere so that uh, you will feel a bit less pressured when it comes to the exam. But attending a mock exam with us or with Fintram or with uh, me specifically uh, as well, uh, uh, or the benefit of doing, doing that is that we will be, uh, I will be providing you with a feedback on those uh, mock papers as well. I would be able to identify what are the areas where you need a bit more improvement, what are, what are the, uh, you know, concepts that you need uh, a better understanding of, and all these feedback will be provided to you with the mock exam as well. Okay, folks, so that's, that's basically something that, uh, that, that's definitely there. <clears throat> And final step is step six, which is go write your exam. Just confidently go write your exam after you've completed all the previous steps as well. So that's basically how the preparation process works when it comes to the AAA paper. Okay, folks, so yeah. Now, moving on. So let's talk about what, uh, what FinTram offers as well. Okay, folks, they, we will be conducting, you know, live interactive sessions where we will cover, you know, majority of the sessions and some of them would be provided to you as a recording uh, as well. Just some of them, that's basically it. And of course, uh, there's also the live question practice, including the past papers as well. Okay, folks, of course, when it comes to the AAA paper, it's not just, a, no, as I mentioned earlier as well, it's not just about, you know, learning the content itself. Okay, folks, it's also about applying that, uh, applying that knowledge into uh, specific scenarios that that can come up in the exam as well, isn't it? So I'm training you guys to uh, to tackle any and every question that can come up in the exam. And of course, we will be discussing a lot of uh, efficiency factors, especially when it comes to the CDE environment, right? So, uh, uh, and of course, we will be practicing questions within the CDE itself, so there's that. And uh, we will also be looking at some exam techniques that can be adopted specific to the AAA exam as well, because there's a way of writing the answer. There's a way of structuring your answer in front of the examiners. And that's what we cover uh, when practicing questions in a live sessions as well. Okay, folks. Now, uh, moving on to the next aspect, we have doubt clearing sessions as well. Of course, uh, uh, we, we also, you know, there's since, since it's a live session, you guys could definitely ask questions throughout the session itself. Like, what we do now, like you guys are shooting questions in the chat box, isn't it? So uh, just like that, we will be taking up questions and our sessions would be more interactive. I, uh, you know, when, when it comes to the live sessions, we, we would be uh, all on video, like face-to-face -face as well. Well, virtually face-to-face, -face, I should say. Uh, and uh, if you guys have any questions and even in between sessions, just uh, shoot them and I will definitely take that up and clear up then and uh, clear the, that up then and then. And uh, after this course content, there would be some uh, weekly sessions where we uh, after, after we cover the entire you know syllabus of uh, AAA and practice some questions, there would be some more uh, uh, additional sessions where we uh, where we come on live and clear some doubts, discuss some uh, discuss some uh, examiner's report and technical articles, right? So that's another uh, set of sessions that we uh, we provide to you guys uh, as part of this particular course as well. And finally, there is the mock exam as well. Okay, folks, as I mentioned earlier, we provide you with uh, mock exams. Uh, you know, we will correct them and we'll provide you with the valuable feedback of these things as well. Okay, folks, so uh, keep that in mind. <clears throat> and uh, let me tell you guys, this mock exam is a really, really crucial part when it comes to uh, when it comes to tackling this particular paper of AAA because you know it's it's really important that you have that feedback as to what are the areas which you have to improve, especially when it comes to the exam. And of course, as we all know, Fintram Global is a is a really gold approved uh, learning partner, and we have we have conducted uh, we have provided. 
uh, classes to students across the world as well. So, uh, you know, most of them, they, they, they really like the uh, idea of this, um, you know, uh, mock exam and they really appreciate the feedback that are uh, given during these mock exams as well. So I, I really hope that you mandatorily attend, attend this particular aspect as well. So yeah, that's basically, uh, you know, uh, most of the things that we uh, provide from Fintram. Do you, do you guys have any questions up until now? All right, guys. So when it comes to audit and assurance, I'm not talking about advanced audit and assurance. That's the paper's name. We all know that. Uh, so when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to those terms, audit and assurance, what exactly does it mean? I'm going to start from there. Okay, folks. So most, some of you might know as to what audit, uh, audit is or what, uh, what, uh, you know, an assurance or concept of assurance is, but, uh, from your, let's say, uh, professional, uh, you know, if you are, let's say, working professionals or professional auditors currently in the industry as well, but guys, there are certain terminologies. There are certain, uh, you know, there's a particular set of language that we all know the audit language probably even if you are an audit professional but there is a set of terminologies and set of concepts that we learn uh, within the acc syllabus itself which is specific to acc or which is specific uh, uh, to this particular uh, acc course since we are based out of the uk as well okay folks so you know there are you know it all depends upon the uh, standards that we follow. We do follow the international standards, yes, but uh, you might be familiar with some of the terminologies, but uh, I could definitely say that some of these uh, terminologies that we use uh, throughout the session, not just in this particular thing, but throughout the session could be a bit new. You may understand the concept, but that terminology might be new to you as well. So uh, I'm just going to introduce uh, one such terminology uh, terminologies that possibly might be new to you. It, it's a very basic thing. It's basically known as assurance engagement. Okay, folks, uh, do let me know if you have heard of this particular terminology before, uh, you know, perhaps in your audit and assurance paper, perhaps, or perhaps in uh, various other uh, professional courses as well. Uh, do let me know on, uh, about that in the chat box, yes or no. Uh, but yeah, let's just discuss as to what this is, shall we? Because there's a, definitely a definition for assurance engagement, and I'm just going to read through that real quick. Uh, assurance engagement, uh, as mentioned over here, <clears throat> Let me just uh, highlight this. There we go. Assurance engagement is an engagement in which a practitioner obtains sufficient and appropriate evidence in order to express a conclusion designed to enhance the degree of confidence of the intended user other than the responsible party about the outcome of, a, uh, of the evaluation of or measurement of a subject matter against criteria. Hmm. <clears throat> so this seems like a really, uh, you know, really complex definition with a really, you know, technical words, I would say, isn't it? So whenever such complex topics or whenever such, uh, you know, complex, uh, you know, stuff come up, comes up within the syllabus area, what we usually have to do is we have to break it down. Okay, folks, break down the complexity or reduce the complexity. That's basically our objectivity because it's only complex because you don't understand it as of now, right? So let's just uh, break down this particular definition and then understand things bit by bit, shall we? Uh, so just give me a minute. <clears throat> All right, so I'm just gonna break it down over here. And here, there we go. So now let's look at this particular definition one by one so that we can understand things in a, in a bit more better sense, shall we? Assurance engagement is an engagement in which a practitioner obtains sufficient and appropriate evidence. Okay, so let's let's focus on this particular aspect. It is an engagement, isn't it? So what, what does an engagement mean here? It's obviously a business engagement between two or more individuals. That's that's basically the idea behind that, isn't it? In which a practitioner, okay, so there's someone known as a practitioner, and what does he do? He obtains a he obtains sufficient and appropriate evidence. Okay. Now, whenever you learn a particular concept or learn a particular definition or even any other concepts as well, not just in this paper, but in any paper. You should always question yourself. Okay, folks, what exactly is this? Because that's how you learn new things. Okay, folks, you should, whenever you are reading something or whenever you are, uh, you know, learning a particular concept, you should you should question yourself as to 
what is this and why are we doing this or uh, how exactly is this done? All these questions should be asked to yourself. Okay, folks, so I'm just going to ask a question to myself. It is said here that it is an engagement in which a practitioner obtains sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. Okay, so uh, we have someone known as a practitioner and he's obtaining sufficient and appropriate uh, evidence, isn't it? Okay, so why exactly are we obtaining this? Well, let's talk about that. In order to express a conclusion, okay, folks, in order to express a conclusion designed to enhance the degree of confidence of the intended users other than the responsible party. So there's someone known as a practitioner and what does he do? He obtains sufficient and appropriate evidence. Okay, folks, and why exactly are, we, are they doing this? So that they can express a conclusion over something. Okay, folks, so uh, why exactly are we providing this conclusion? To enhance the degree of confidence of the intended user. So there is someone known as the intended user. And then there's another uh, other set of people known as the responsible party. So we are just providing a conclusion or the practitioner, not we, practitioner, is providing a conclusion on the, uh, sorry, providing conclusion to the intended users, but not the responsible party to enhance their degree of confidence. Okay, folks. Now, what else? Uh, well, before going into the third part, uh, let's, let's apply this in an audit scenario. We all know what audit is, right? It's basically when someone known as the auditor reviews the financial statements, identify mistakes, and then provides their opinion on the uh, on the financial statements to whom? The particular uh, intended users, or in other words, the uh, shareholders of the organization or to the general public or stakeholders of that particular organization, isn't it? To provide it in a bit more broader, broader term. That's basically as to what audit is, to put it very simply. We all know that, of course, we're standing at the AAA paper. Of course, we know that, isn't it? So uh, when it comes to assurance engagement, this is a broader term than audit. Okay, folks, audit or the external audit that we know is just a type of assurance engagement. Okay, folks, there are several other assurance engagements as well. For example, if I have to break it down, I could say that, uh, you know, assurance engagement can be broken down into various things like the external audit <clears throat> and there could be uh, perhaps other review engagements as well, isn't it? So yeah, well, still better than what a doctor would do. So yeah, <laughs> now, uh, when it comes to the uh, assurance engagement, there could be uh, external audit, review engagements. There is something known as internal audit as well. So there are many types of assurance engagement like these. Okay, folks. So primarily, throughout the particular entire course uh, of, let's say, AA, the skill level paper, we, if you have attempted the AA paper, uh, then we would have learned about uh, you know, external audit as a whole, isn't it? We have learned the entire process in AA itself. However, when it comes to AAA, we will be we will not just be learning about external audit, but the other types of assurance engagements as well, such as forensic audit, such as review of prospective financial statements, such as uh, you know, a due diligence and various other concepts as well. Okay, folks, various other assurance engagements will be learned throughout the entire course. Okay, folks, so I just want to give you that particular idea here. Now, coming back to the definition. So in every engagement or in every engagement that we spoke about, be it external audit, be it review engagements, be it review of prospective financial uh, financial uh, uh, information or any other, uh, any other engagements, what exactly happens? There is someone known as a practitioner, first of all. And this practitioner, well, in the case of an external audit, it's basically the auditor, isn't it? So this auditor, what he does is he obtains sufficient and appropriate audit evidence to provide a conclusion, or in other words, an opinion on the financial statement, isn't it? So that's basically what happens in the audit. And why are we doing this? And this is provided to the intended users, which is the stakeholders of the organization. And why exactly are we doing this? To enhance their degree of confidence over the financial statements. Okay, folks, the financial statements here is known as subject matter. Okay, folks, so uh, we're not providing this to the responsible party. Who is the responsible party here, though? We have looked, we have talked about practitioners as well as uh, intended users as well, isn't it? So who is the responsible party then? 
responsible party are those people who is in charge of preparing the financial statement. In, the, in our case, in the case of an external audit, it's basically the management itself, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Okay, folks. Now, uh, we have, again, we have something, someone known as a practitioner who obtains sufficient appropriate audit evidence, who expresses a conclusion to enhance the degree of the intended uses other than the responsible party. About what? About the outcome of the evaluation or measurement of a subject matter against criteria. So what are we doing here, guys? Uh, as a practitioner, okay, folks, we as a practitioner, uh, are uh, we are comparing a subject matter. In the case of an audit, it'll be the financial statement against the criteria. What criteria is this? It could be IFR standards, it could be accounting standards, various other laws and regulations, etc. cetera. Okay, folks, we're comparing it with uh, against the criteria to ensure as to whether everything has been prepared uh, or every, uh, the financial statement has been prepared in line with these accounting standards or not, isn't it? So that's basically what we do here, okay, folks. So as I mentioned earlier, assurance engagement is just a broader concept. That's basically it. So what happens in an assurance engagement? Let's finalize things. Uh, one second. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so let's finalize things. There is a, It is an engagement, guys, and uh, it, it is where a practitioner obtains sufficient and appropriate audit evidence, and they express a conclusion designed to enhance the degree of confidence of the intended user, which is the uh, shareholders or other stakeholders of the organization, uh, other than the responsible party. So we're not providing the opinion to the management, isn't it? Or uh, the people who are preparing the subject matter. We're not providing the opinion to them, but for the it is for the intended users. And uh, on what aspect are we providing this conclusion on? It's basically provided uh, uh, on, a, on a subject matter after it is compared to a criteria, isn't it? So that's basically the idea behind an assurance engagement. It's just a, just a broader concept. Okay, folks, that's basically it. And remember, guys, external audit is just a type of assurance engagement. So complex definition has been broken down into simple things, isn't it? So that's basically what we do uh, throughout the entire course. Okay, folks, just to, uh, just to give you guys a filler on that. <clears throat> and of course, there are really... Uh, a really set of interesting set of things that uh, you guys would learn. For example, if you are, let's say, I don't know which profession you are in, but uh, you know, if you are, let's say, a working professional, and if you are in the audit uh, sector as of now, you may have, you might be familiar with internal audit or external audit, but there are also several other types of, you know, uh, assurance engagement. I'm not going to use the term audit. There are, there are several other types of assurance engagement that you will learn about throughout this course as well, which is really, really relevant for the exam as well. Okay, folks, so there's also that. Now, uh, Moving on to external audit. So let's quickly take a look at as to what it is. Now that we know what assurance engagement is, it's kind of easy to, uh, and we have already discussed as to what audit is as well, isn't it? So let's quickly read through this as well, shall we? An external audit is a type of assurance engagement that is carried out by an auditor to give an independent opinion on a set of financial statements. So what happens here? It is a type of assurance engagement. We've learned that. And it is carried out by an auditor to give an independent opinion. Okay, folks, so the auditor gives an independent opinion on a set of financial statements. That's basically what happens in an external audit, to put it in very simple terms. So there is an, also a really uh, interesting uh, you know, paragraph given within ISA 200 as well. So let's learn as to what that is real quick, shall we? The objective of an audit or financial statement is to enable the auditor to express an opinion on whether the financial statements are prepared in all material respects. Now, I've already mentioned a simple definition over here, isn't it? So why exactly have I included such a simple thing over here as well? Well, the idea here is that I just want you to uh, keep an eye out for these, uh, you know, uh, these terms and stuff like that. Okay, folks, because, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to the AA or AAA exams, especially since we are talking about AAA, let's just stick with that. When it comes to the AAA exam, whenever you're writing the answer, there should be some amount of technical terminologies that, that should be there. Okay, folks, so that's exactly why we're looking at these technical definitions as well. Of course, conceptually, it's kind of a simple thing, but you know, when you're writing your answers, sometimes you may have to add some terms uh, which only, a, only an auditor can use. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. Now, uh, is to enable the auditor to express an opinion whether the financial statements are prepared in all material respects. That's a really key term, okay, folks? An auditor ensures that the financial statement 
is prepared in all material respects. What does this mean? It just means that, to put it very simply, it just means that, uh, you know, uh, there is no issues or it is uh, everything is under materiality. There's no, there's not much errors in the financial statements, etc. That's basically all it is. Okay, folks. However, since we are, you know, you know, to mention all those stuff in a bit more uh, short manner, I would say, uh, well, it, it is a technical term, but still, it's, uh, you know, it makes things a bit more simple, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, in order to simplify everything or in order to, uh, you know, show it in a really cool manner, I would say, let's just use the term uh, prepared in all material respects. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. And of course, uh, in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework. Hmm. That's a really cool term as well, isn't it? So what does what, what applicable financial reporting framework mean then? Well, basically, the IFR standards, the IA standards, or any local accounting standards such as the US CAP or Indian accounting standards, or there are several uh, jurisdictions with uh, you know several types of standards as well as in it. So that's basically what the applicable financial reporting framework is. Okay, folks, it's basically the framework of financial reporting. What exactly are the standards that we use? What exactly are the uh, you know local accounting standards that we use or local laws and regulations that we follow? All these things. Okay, folks, so that's basically it. So as an auditor, we're just ensuring that the financial statements are prepared in line with these uh, financial reporting framework. That's basically all there is to it. Okay, folks. Now, moving on to the next aspect. <clears throat> so let's talk about the objectives of an audit in a bit more simpler sense. Okay, folks, or in a, in a bit more in, uh, not a simpler sense, but in a bit more detail. Okay, folks. Now, uh, is there any questions up until now? Let me just uh, get a confirmation on that. You can just shoot it on the chat box and mute yourself as well. That's also fine. <clears throat> okay. Okay, nothing as of now, but uh, yeah, I'll I'll keep on checking the chat box. So feel free to shoot the shoot the questions. Okay, folks. Now, coming back to the objectives of an audit, there are primarily three objectives when it comes to an audit. First of all, the auditor. Okay, folks, the auditor should state an opinion. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. The auditor should state an opinion as to whether the financial statements comply with these three things. Okay, folks, what are these three things? First of all, does it provide a true and fair view? That's something that, that we need to confirm as auditors, isn't it? Does the uh, you know financial statement provide a true and fair view? Is uh, everything stated within the financial statements true? Has it been fairly recorded? Like, for example, uh, have, we take, have we applied the principle of uh, commercial substance over legal form and stuff like that? That's basically what it is. We will, of course, deep dive into it in a later session, so don't worry about that. And we, as auditors, we also make sure that the accounting records prepared by management are accurate and complete. Okay. Two terminologies here. Okay, folks, financial statements and then accounting records. What is the difference between these? We know what the financial statements are, isn't it? There are five documents that comprises the uh, financial statement. There is the statement of financial position or otherwise known as a balance sheet in some uh, countries or some uh, in some other uh, professional courses or various other uh, jurisdictions as well. And... Uh, there is the statement of profit or loss. There is the statement of changes in equity. There is the notes to financial statements as well. Is there only four? There's one more, isn't it? There's the statement of cash flows as well, isn't it? So these five documents comprise of the uh, financial statements. What about accounting records then? What are we talking about here? The financial statements is basically the end product that is issued to the public by the organization isn't it? Or by the audit client in our situation, isn't it? However, these financial statements are prepared from accounting records, such as journal entries. And journal entries are summarized into ledgers. And from ledgers, we create a trial balance. And from trial balance, we create a financial statements. Basic accountancy, isn't it? That's basically it. Okay, folks. So whenever I say accounting records, we basically mean the uh, journal entries and stuff like that. Okay, folks. So that's basically as to what it is. And financial statement is basically the end product that we get from uh, the final accounting process. That's basically all there is to it. So as auditors, we need to ensure that these accounting records are also accurate and complete as well. Okay, folks, that's the second thing that we should confirm. And finally, <clears throat> we should ensure that the financial statements are prepared in accordance with an applicable financial reporting framework 
in all material respects. Again, those technical terminologies have come up again, isn't it? So remember, guys, these terminologies, uh, you know, I know that you could explain things in a bit more simpler sense when it comes to the exam, but using such terminologies or within your answer or within your, uh, yeah, within your answer when it comes to the exam is really crucial. Okay, folks, because these terminologies are only, uh, you know, can only be used by a particular auditor who has the knowledge of these, uh, you know, IAC standards, IFR standards, et cetera, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Okay, folks, so remember these terminologies, it's, it's kind of really important that you know this. <clears throat> so uh, what is the final objective? Ultimately to ensure that the financial statements are prepared according to the applicable financial framework, a financial reporting framework, that is the IA standards, IFR standards, et cetera, or local accounting standards in all material respects. Okay, folks, it should be uh, accurate and complete and there should not be any issues in any manner. That's basically the idea here. Okay, folks. Now, moving on to one of the final topics that I'll be covering in this particular session. Uh, the regulatory environment of external audits. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, especially when I discussed the first uh, part of the syllabus area, we will be primarily focusing on uh, regulatory environment of the external auditors, isn't it? So what are the regulations that the auditors must follow? There are three basic regulations, okay, folks? First of all, there's the national law. So the reason why I've mentioned it as national law here is that you're, you're all attempting the AAA international variant. So uh, guys, remember when it comes to different jurisdictions, there are different laws and regulations that they follow, isn't it? For example, in India, we have a Companies Act. And in the UK, we have Companies Act 2006 that we follow. And in the US, it's basically the Sarbanes-Oxley Act as well. <clears throat> uh, yeah. So Sarbanes-Oxley Act is basically, uh, yeah. It's basically a bit a bit more rule-based than principle-based. That's basically the uh, idea here. And it's something that uh, that has introduced after, you know, huge corporate scandals like Enron and stuff like that. So yeah, kind of interesting as well. I have went through that uh, from my, you know, personal professional experiences as well. So uh, yeah, I have audited a few, uh, you know, US clients. So there's that, not to brag, but yeah. Anyway, uh, so when it comes to national law, we have different national law in different uh, jurisdictions. Okay, folks, so we have Companies Act in the UK, Sabine's Oxley Act in the US, and for various other countries, there are different other uh, different other things as well. <clears throat> okay. So, yeah. Uh, okay, so the, I see a uh, quick off-topic fact uh, provided by Rankin here. I uh, heard that UK SOX is coming from financial year 2023, whether this will be covered in a recent item or technical items. Please ignore if not relevant. Yeah, it, it, I'm glad, glad that you, uh, uh, you know, raised this, raised this particular aspect as well. It's kind of interesting, uh, really. Uh, uh, yeah, you and I have, uh, you know, heard uh, something of the similar lines as well. But uh, yeah, it all depends on, you know, whether they release a technical article on this. Okay, folks, because the most latest, uh, I can tell you this as well, when it comes to the AAA paper, the most latest stuff that is covered in current issues or developments are usually released as a technical article. Okay, folks? So we will be, uh, you know, it, it's always great to have, uh, you know, a constant watch on those technical articles to see if there is any new releases and stuff like that. Ideally, as of now, the, the new concepts that are introduced relate to sustainability aspects. Okay, folks? Uh, and of course, data analytics is something, but it has been sometimes since it, it has been released. So perhaps they might uh, include something on this particular aspect, but uh, I think it it's primarily oriented towards the UK variant as well. Nothing can be said as of now, but it, uh, but I'm glad that you raised that, Rangan. Uh, you should always uh, keep an eye out for those technical articles, okay, folks, to see if there's anything new that has come up. Of course, I will be doing that from my side as well, and I will be discussing uh, if, if there is any new technical articles as well. So don't worry much about that, okay, folks. Yeah, that will be covered. I can I can definitely uh, watch on that. <clears throat> Uh, as I said before, one of the regulations that we follow is basically the uh, national law, which is Companies Act as well as Surveillance Oxley Act. And of course, secondly, we also have the International Standards on Audit as well, okay, folks, which is the ISA standards. That is the primary set of standards that we learn throughout the course. Okay, folks, there are, uh, if you have attempted the AA paper, uh, you know, if you have attempted the skill level papers in any way, you would uh, be familiar with some of the ISA concepts. But 
Uh, when it comes to the AAA, there are a few additional things that you have to learn as well. For example, uh, there are a few revised standards that has been released as well. So we will be looking into those uh, IAC standards as well. So that's, that's something that's there. And of course, uh, there is also the, uh, yeah. Uh, so when it comes to IAC, well, when it comes to the international, AAA international variant, we are learning about, uh, you know, IAC standards, but there are also some local audit standards, which we have to keep an eye out for as well as auditors. Okay, folks, there's that. And finally, there is the code of ethics. Okay, folks, so uh, code of ethics is something that the auditor must follow as well, because as auditors, if you're providing an opinion on the financial statement, then it has to be independent, isn't it? What does that mean? That basically means that the auditor should not have any relations with the client, isn't it? Any professional, sorry, any uh, business relations or any shareholdings or anything like that with the client, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Okay, folks, so we have to comply with the code of ethics uh, and make sure that we are independent. Okay, folks, there are no ethical threads and stuff like that. That's basically it. So when it comes to code of ethics, there are two things that we have to look at. There is the ACCA's Code of Ethics, as well as the IESB uh, Code of Ethics as well. Okay, folks, IESB is basically International Ethical Standards Board, isn't it? So I don't necessarily have to provide you with the full form of ACCA, do I? So, uh, yeah, uh, IESB is basically, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, it's kind of on the similar lines. It's just that we have a few other, you know, uh, rules and regulations to follow. That's it. That's basically it. The concept or fundamental principles are kind of the same in both of these. So yeah. So these are the two uh, code of conducts that we have to follow as professional auditors and practice. Okay, folks. So that's basically the idea behind uh, code of ethics. <clears throat> So, yeah, that's basically, uh, you know, all I wanted to cover in this particular session. Of course, we will, there are a lot of uh, more interesting sessions and more, uh, you know, relevant facts and uh, facts and uh, information to consider in the upcoming sessions as well. Okay, folks, so uh, up until now, do you guys have any other questions that you want to know? Uh, any other, uh, you know, clarifications or questions that you want to know? Just uh, let me know in the chat box. I could open it up. I think we are like one minute, uh, you know, over time, I guess. So, uh, yeah, uh, just just let me know if you have any other questions. Okay, folks. <clears throat> Short form is allowed in the exam, like ISSB, ISA, etc. Yes, definitely. Okay, folks, you could use short forms like uh, ISA, you know, IFRS, and then, uh, you know, ACCA, I would say. So, yeah, there are different, uh, you can definitely use that for, you know, uh, I can see that, yeah. Uh, so, so for Surveyance Oxley, you can just use SOX. We don't, we won't be using Surveyance Oxley much because, you know, uh, we're more, more oriented towards the UK style of things. So there's that. But yeah, short forms can be used to answer your question, definitely. <clears throat> But there are instances where, you know what, that's, uh, well, that's kind of, a, you know, uh, yeah, you, you could definitely use the short forms, but uh, there would be some kinds of questions that can come up in the AAA exams, like uh, you have to evaluate some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of, uh, you know, yeah, evaluate some sort of, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, evaluate and extract of the auditor's report. So for questions like that, yeah. Uh, it's a bit, a bit off topic, but yeah, I can only explain that when we get there. Okay, folks, so definitely that's that's something that's it. But generally, for auditors, can for the 50 mark questions, etc., you can definitely use, use short forms. That's that's not a problem. Yeah, okay. I see another questions in the recorded sessions. How regularly would be the... Okay, in the recorded sessions. Uh, okay, so uh, let me just uh, give you a brief idea here. Uh, when it comes to the live sessions, if you are, uh, you know, registering for the live sessions, uh, we would have around, uh, you know, around, I would say most of the sessions are, will be, you know, uh, live face-to-face -face sessions, okay, folks, uh, where we will be, uh, you know, getting on call, coming on video, and then discuss the topic on a live format. Uh, but, uh, uh, and some of the, only some of these sessions, okay, folks, some minor uh, items, minor topics, I would say, uh, would be in a recorded format, and some questions would also be in a recorded format. Okay, folks, the rest of the items are basically, you know, live sessions itself. So uh, I'm not sure if you are asking about the, you know, 100% recorded sessions or not, but yeah, if you can confirm that, I could just explain more on that as well. <clears throat> Any other questions, guys?
And as for the question, uh, how regularly would the doubt uh, clearing sessions be? Well, basically, uh, I'm asking only about the recorded sessions. Okay, so if you are interested in just getting the recorded sessions, the doubt clearing sessions will be conducted on a weekly basis. Okay, folks, from uh, the month of January, because of course, December is a holiday month, isn't it? So yeah. And as for the live live sessions, we will be starting our the next set of sessions from uh from the first uh, first week of January. Well, the late first week of January, I would say. Uh, and I will try to wrap things up by uh, if you're interested in the live sessions, of course. I will try to uh, wrap things up by the first half of February as well, okay, folks, so that you get some time to practice some questions as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically what the model is. And for the live sessions, the classes uh, we uh, the classes would be on, on weekdays, the classes would be from, uh, you know, uh, 8 to 10, 10, 30, 8 to 10, or, uh, you know, and on, and on weekends, it would be a two and a, two and a half hour sessions from uh, 10 to 12 as well, 10, 10 to 12, 30 as well. Okay, folks, that's basically how the uh, timing is going to be, just to give you guys an idea. <clears throat> All right, any other questions, guys? Ranga, anything from your side? I'm sorry if I'm, you know, mispronouncing your name in any way. So, yeah. <laughs> no, sir, you, it's okay. So, only one question. I'm just unmute myself. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Uh, if you can, sir, give us one timeline, because uh, for a working mm -hmm. professional, we mm -hmm. need to spend 10 to 11 hours in office. So, uh, what should be the timeline right now? If we start from today, what should mm -hmm. be our target to complete the syllabus area, then RBC, and then mock? Uh, something okay. like difficult give. I would try to complete things like content, syllabus content wise. Okay, folks, I'm talking about that. Uh, well, I'll talk about two things here. One is the syllabus content aspect, and secondly, the practice aspect. Okay, folks, so syllabus wise or con syllabus content wise, I would. Like I understand that you know you guys might be busy from you know during the week of uh, you know Christmas and stuff like that. So I'm just gonna go after that. Okay, folks, January. We have two months to prepare for the. Uh, assuming that there are two, you guys have two months to prepare for the March exam. I have January and February, right? So content-wise, I would complete things for a working professional. Definitely, I would complete things from January to the uh, you know first half of February. Okay, folks, and when I when I talk about question practice aspect, after a few of our sessions, you could definitely practice questions from the second half of January itself. Okay, folks, so that's basically how it is. So it's all about devoting time. You guys, you know, I I understand that you guys are working. Uh, some some of you guys are working professionals, working from uh, you know, from a ten to eight or nine thirty or you know where, how much it uh, how much ever it goes I, I totally understand that because I my, myself am a working professional as well which is why the sessions are always at you know at, at 8 a.m or uh, it can even be 7 30 as well depending upon you know the nature of students that we have as well so yeah there's there's also that so uh, I would say content wise just start try to finish the content by the first half of February itself because you need to leave some time for complete question practice itself. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea here. So complete the content by the first half of February and start practicing questions from the second half of January itself. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. I hope that's clear to you, Rangan. <clears throat> oh, yes. Okay. Any other questions? Could wait for maybe five more minutes, I guess. <clears throat> Any other questions, guys? I see a new name in the board. Uh, Lapna, I believe, right? I, oh, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, if you have any questions, Saumya, anyone, uh, just uh, let me know, okay? You can also type it in the chat box as well. Uh, who was that? Okay. Some said no. Oh, okay, so how many papers are there in ACCA? <laughs> okay, uh, seems like a general question. Okay, uh, <clears throat> in total there are fifteen papers in ACCA. You just have to clear thirteen of them. 
okay, folks. So that's that's basically the idea. Uh, well, that's basically because uh, you know uh, when it comes to the professional papers, there are four optional papers. You just have to choose two out of them. So yeah, that's basically the idea here. But uh, seems like a basic question. So if you can tell me, uh, if if you need any other, you know, if if you want to ask any other follow up questions on that, then feel free. Sorry, uh, you have to complete uh, I believe twelve papers, I believe. Yeah, sorry about that. Wait, yeah, thirteen papers. Sorry, yeah, thirteen papers itself. Can we copy paste from exhibit in the exam? Yes, definitely. Okay, folks, you can definitely uh, copy paste things uh, from the exhibit in the scenario to your answer. Yeah, that's that's possible. But uh, just a just a I would say disclaimer over there. Uh, when you are copy pasting, just make sure that you are rephrasing things. Okay, folks, that particular sentence should be, uh, you know, should fit in with your answer. So that's something that's there. Maybe some slight rewording and stuff, but definitely you can copy copy paste things from the exhibit, from the scenario to your answer. That's that's definitely there. Is the exam online or offline? Okay. It's definitely, well, it's a computer-based exam. So you can attempt it in you know two methods. Either uh, you, you can attempt it as a remote exam from your home itself, or uh, you can book a CBE center or an exam center when it comes to the exam as well. That's basically how it's usually done. Yeah. This class is paid or unpaid. OK, so uh, OK. Uh, this is a free session, of course. Uh, you don't have to pay or anything. Uh, you can definitely register with us for the rest of the, you know, sessions as well. So yeah. <clears throat> you can definitely, uh, and I'm glad that you raised that question, Lopna. So uh, as you can see in the screen with me, it is visible to you, right? Can you just give me a thumbs up or something to confirm? Okay. Okay, so uh, yes, yeah, since it's visible, as you can see here, we have the uh, contact number of Fintram, the website name, and you know, uh, the email IDs as well. So you can just uh, uh, you know, contact Fintram and get get your seat uh, seats booked for the upcoming uh, AAA sessions. Okay, folks. So yeah, <clears throat> and to answer another question, so which book do you prefer, BPP or Kaplan? If I had a dime for every time a student asked me that question. So, uh, yeah, uh, when it comes to the AAA paper, I would just I would say just stick with one paper. Okay, folks. Uh, sorry, one uh, resource. Okay, folks. As in, you know, out of BPP and Kaplan, just stick with one. That is, if you want Kaplan, then stick with that. If you want BPP, you can st stick with that as well. Uh, there's also some other resources that we provide from Fintram as well. Some questions. Uh, plus, you have the ACCA's uh, past papers as well. So. Yeah, that's that's basically enough, I would say. The reason why I'm choose uh, I'm asking you guys to choose between uh, choose one between BPP or Kaplan is because you know there are common questions in both these uh, revision kits. So yeah, I think it's uh, it's just uh, it's okay if you do one of them as well. So yeah, especially for working professional, you you may not have time to do both of them. So you stick with one. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so for how many papers we will get your class? Okay, so uh. Well, just to answer that particular question as well, uh, I uh, at, at Fintram you you could get uh, my PM, APM, uh, AA, and AAA sessions. So yeah, that's basically the uh, papers that I take, and I believe we also have most of the other papers at Fintram itself. You could definitely have a have a look out on this particular Fintram's website and you know go through those as well. Mm. Whether Fintram syllabus and RBC. RBC revision bootcamp, I believe. Yeah, it's not enough. Uh, see, I'm not gonna constrain with any resources, but I can give you this. Okay, folks, when it comes to the syllabus, like learning the syllabus, Fintram resources are enough because I myself am personally preparing the notes, and uh, you know, I have uh, you know, I have I myself have you know, uh, have invested a lot of time. I'm not gonna say uh, you know, uh, it's 
I like uh, spend a lot of time, but I have invested a lot, a lot of time in reading through these Kaplan books, BP, BP books, my own personal do notes during my study days, and uh, you know uh, various other resources as well, and compiled all the essence to create these notes. Okay, folks. So syllabus wise. Uh, you know, you won't be requiring an additional study text like BPP or Kaplan or, any, or anything like that. Okay, folks, uh, when I say BPP or Kaplan resources, I mean the exam kits. Okay, folks, that's what's necessary here. Because question practice, it's never enough. I can tell you that. Okay, folks, as in you, you have to practice as many questions as you can. Syllabus-wise, our notes and our resources are just enough for you uh, to learn all these concepts. And you have me with, with the resources as well. So if you have any sort of questions or something like that, you can just ask me about that. That's, that's totally fine. But uh, when it comes to question practice, uh, you know, the RBC, the, the main objective of Revision Bootcamp is to give you guys a quick revision. If you're registering for the live sessions, then obviously we will be conducting the revision live. And, uh, you know, we would, uh, and we also provide some uh, questions as well. And the objective of that is because, uh, is that, you know, you will get an idea as to what is the exam technique, how exactly can I answer present my answer in a more uh, beautiful manner towards the examiner, et cetera. That's, that's basically the objective of RBC. Okay, folks. Uh, and of course, uh, you should practice more questions. Definitely go go for the uh, exam kits, BPP or Kaplan. Go for the past papers. That's that's more important. That's that's a bit more a really important resource that you should refer to as well. You know, go to the past exam library or the uh, CBE platform within the ACCA platform itself and, uh, you know, do questions over there as well. That's That's also necessary to prepare for this exam. I hope that answers your question. Please don't, uh, you know, uh, waste too much time, uh, you know, in reading through the study text uh, like BPP or uh, uh, like Kaplan study text because, you know, I have already done that for you and, you know, I have, you know, prepared the notes and, you know, everything, uh, every other resources like that based on this. So you just have to refer to the notes and uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to myself uh, after you register as well. So, yeah, that's basically the idea. And of course, yeah, uh, you you could, uh, you know, once you register, the team will provide you with my contact information so that, uh, you know, you guys you guys can ask me questions directly whenever you want. Okay, folks, I will of course re uh, uh, reply to those as well. So that's that's another uh, feature. I'm glad that you mentioned that, Rangan. So yeah, <clears throat> anything else, guys? Anything at all? Just uh, let me know. All right. Okay, that's, I guess that's all for the question. All right, guys, so thank you. Thank you so much for uh, attending this session and I hope you really, really enjoyed it as well. And I, I really look forward to see you all uh, in the upcoming uh, sessions as well. Okay, folks, so thank you so much. If you have any further questions, then uh, then definitely let me know. Uh, you know, you can you can contact the FinTram team with the details given over here. It's just just uh, let them know, and uh, you know you can register yourself uh, for the uh, for the upcoming fours, and let's let's tackle the uh, March attempt together, shall we? Okay, guys, thank you, thank you so much.